topic is, how can we pray for you? <laughs> Simple. If you know somebody of you who needs prayer, maybe you yourself needs prayer, just, uh, just give us a call and let us take it to the throne of grace today. Uh, well, we going to have, we have a script, our scripture text is taken from, from the book of James in the New Testament, the book of James, James chapter 5, verse 16 to 18. It says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was as human as we are. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then he prayed again, and the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crops. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for today that we can be here. Father, there are many that are watching that probably, Lord, they're going through a, a situation or circumstance that has become desperate. Lord, in Jesus' name, you are God who answers prayer. So, Lord, we, we pray for them this morning and ask, Lord God, that that you will touch lives through the power of your Holy Spirit. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. These are some letters that were written by children to God. Uh, here's one say, Dear God, thank you for the baby brother, <laughs> but what I prayed for was a puppy, Joyce. Is one say, Dear God, it rained for our old vacation, and my, is my father mad? He said some things about you that people are not supposed to say. <laughs> but I hope you will not hurt him in any way. Your friend. But I'm not going to tell you who I am. <laughs> Here's this one. It says, Dear God, please send me a pony. I never asked for anything before. You can look it up. This is from Bruce. And says, Dear God, if we come back as something, please don't let me come back as Mary Horton because I hate her. This is from Denise. Here's one. Dear God, if you give me a genie like Aladdin, I will give you anything you want. No. Anything except my money and my chest set. <laughs> That's from Raphael. It says, this one says, Dear God, we read Thomas Edison made light. <laughs> but in Sunday school, they said you did it. So, so I, I Bessie stole your idea. Sincerely, Donna. And finally, he says, Dear God, why Sunday school on Sunday? <laughs> I thought it was supposed to be a, a day of rest. Tom. <laughs> you know, today, I, I would like to talk with you about the power of prayer. The power of prayer. You see, it's, it's very clear from the scripture text that we read in that James is trying to to impress upon us that prayer makes a dent in our world. It, it, it makes a dent on the environment. It says that the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. That means when you and I are in the right relationship with God, uh, our prayer has the power to affect things. It, it, has the, it has the power to affect the environment. It has the power to affect the world. It has the power to really change circumstances. Back in, back in the, the, the fourth century AD in Antioch in Syria, there was a great preacher named, uh, named John of Antioch, and he was named Chrysostom, which in Greek means the golden-mouthed because he was a tremendous preacher. 
And uh, he had a sermon on prayer in, in which he said, and you got to get this, he says, it says, the potency of prayer has subdued the strength of fire. It has bridled the rage of lions. It has expelled demons. Yeah. It has broken the chains of death. It has assuaged diseases. It has rescued cities from destruction. It has stopped the sun in its course. It has arrested the progress of the thunderbolt. Pretty powerful, isn't it? Yet all these things are things he found in the Bible that prayer did. Then he added these words. He says, there is in prayer an all-sufficient armory. It says, a treasure undiminished, a mind never exhausted, a sky un unobscured by clouds. A haven, a heaven unruffled by any storm. He said, it's the root, it's the fountain, it's the mother of thousands of blessings. What he's trying to say is that prayer has great power and produces wonderful results. Jesus himself makes an incredible claim, claim along these lines. To me, the, the, the most amazing of all is in, in John, uh, John chapter 14, verse 12 to 14. It says, I tell you the truth. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. So the Son can bring glory to the Father. Then he ends by saying, yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So, all of us can learn how to release the power of prayer, and experience wonderful results. How? By taking these four steps. I want to share them with you. So let's look at them together. Step number one in releasing the power of prayer is to pray. Pray. Let's look again. James chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed, well, we read stories of great Bible heroes like Moses and, and Elijah and Joshua and, and Paul. And, uh, but we think they're out of our league. But notice the first part of James 5.17. It says, Elijah was as human as we are. <laughs> In other words, Elijah was a man just like us. He, he was a man of feeling. He was a man of similar suffering. He knew all about the frailties and, and weakness of human nature. So tell me something, friend. Do you find it hard to pray? No, so did he. But he prayed. Do you ever doubt? Well, so did he, but he prayed. Do you ever get this courage? So did he, but he prayed. <laughs> do you ever grow, do you ever grow tired and, and weary? So did he. But he still prayed. You know what? I believe all of us know there is power in prayer. And, and most of us understand that our priority is to be prayer. When, when you, we read the Gospels, we, we observe Jesus raising the dead and healing the sick and feeding the multitudes and preaching the word, walking on water and casting out demons. Yet his disciples ask him to teach them how to do only one thing. One thing. They ask him to do the one thing that they understood to be foundational to everything else he did. <laughs> Look at me. In Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it says, One of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. 
we too understand that there is power in prayer and that our priority is to be prayer. You know, but, but most of us have a problem with prayer because we are intimidated so we don't pray. As a matter of fact, the greatest reason for unanswered prayer is you and I don't pray. <laughs> the, the, the Baptist pastor and, 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 and evangelist of another era, uh, F.B. Mayer, once, once said, the great tragedy in life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. And, and Billy Graham, Billy Graham, one script that heaven is full of answers to prayers for which no one ever has ever bothered to ask. We might forget to ask, or we just don't ask at all. But James, James says, he has an answer for that. He says, you don't have because you do not ask. So e Elijah didn't make excuses. He prayed, and so should we. All the way through the Bible, we are exhorted to pray. All right, so when we need wisdom, we should pray. When we're suffering, we should pray. When we are tempted, we should pray. Here's one. Before we speak, oh, we should pray. We should pray about the future. We should pray about, pray when we're joyful. We should pray when we're sick. Oh, yeah. The Bible says, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, we should pray without ceasing. In other words, it's continual prayer. But it doesn't mean that, that uh, prayer that prevails without any interruption, but prayer that continues whenever possible. Pray without ceasing. This should be the motto, the motto of every true follower of Jesus Christ. Never stop praying. No matter how dark and hopeless your situation may seem this morning, your responsibility is simply to pray without ceasing, trusting that God, trusting God to act according to His perfect will. Sir, are you living this way? Lady, is, is prayer the environment of your life, the climate in which you live? Folks, I want you to get this. Prayer should be our first choice, not our last resort. Step number two. Step number two in releasing the power of prayer. Pray with a clean heart. Pray with a clean heart. Look at me again, James, James chapter 5, verse 16. He says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power. <laughs> I, I, I want to I take a few minutes to address the question of God not answering our prayers. And, and some of the roadblocks that may keep him from responding. It's so sad to see people reaching out to God and, and then wondering if he even heard their prayers at all. I, I, Elijah is given an, as an example of a, righteous per, a righteous man whose prayer is powerful and effective. Uh, now, James doesn't mean sinless perfection, Mark you when he uses the word righteous, but he means that to be in right relationship with God. James refers to like a, a, a practical righteousness. That is, uh, that we should confess our sins to one another. But watch it. He's not saying you should confess your sins to just everybody, but to trusted believers who will hold us accountable and build us up in Christ. Uh, Psalm, Psalm 66 verse 18 says, 
if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. This is one of the most important statements in all of the Old Testament. Whenever we feel that God is not listening to our prayers, the first thing we must do is examine our hearts to see if it's clean before God. If there's unconfessed sin there, if we are holding on to some sin, cherishing it as it, as it were, and, and refusing to let it go, then God will not listen to our prayers. But when we confess and repent of our sins, and place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he, oh, he takes our sin and He transfers His perfect righteousness to us. Isn't that wonderful? My question is, have you trusted Christ yet, sir? Uh, let me show you another important prayer blocker that the Apostle Peter, he tells us about. He says in, in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, he says, Husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. Here's the point. A godly husband lives with his wife. He doesn't just merely share a house with her, but he truly lives with her. This, that means that he should be understanding and considerate of his wife's spiritual and, and emotional and physical needs. Sir, if you notice there's a dryness in your Christian walk or a brass ceiling that that causes your prayers to bounce back to you. Could it be something is wrong at home? The, the Father God loves us too much to let us go about our business for Him if things aren't right in our families. You see, <laughs> if our faith doesn't work at home, it doesn't work anywhere else. Listen, friend, if your prayers don't seem to be getting through, it may be due to any one of these or, or some other sin that is blocking your access. It's not that God is mad at you. Rather, He loves you so much that if you're walking contrary, contrary to His will, He will be kind of strangely silent, <laughs> you know, that you, you might ask Him to search your heart and, and show you what is wrong. Yeah. Step number three in releasing the power of prayer. Pray earnestly. Pray earnestly. Look again. James chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Elijah was as human as we are. And yet, when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. So many scholars believe that Elijah was the grandest and, and most romantic character that ever Israel ever produced. E Elijah is an excellent example of the power of prayer. His effectiveness in prayer even extended to the weather. <laughs> you see, in, in Elijah's days, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, you remember her, Everybody knows this most infamous queen. They led Israel away from the true God to worship the false god Baal. B-A-A-L, Baal. Baal was the god of rain, you see. And, and the people believed that Baal controlled the heavens and the thunder and the lightning and especially the rain. So Elijah prayed that God would withhold the rain uh, from the land to cause the Israelites to turn back to the true God. Notice that Elijah prayed earnestly, 
earnestly. And somebody says, okay, what does it mean to pray earnestly? Well, glad you asked. Here's your answer. It literally means he prayed in prayer. He prayed in prayer. The deliberate repetition of the words is for emphasis. We, we would say it like this. He prayed fervently. Yeah. When was the last time you wrestled with God in earnest, heaven-moving prayer? The text says, Elijah was as human as we are. If this is true, and it is, it means that we then can be men and women without with the power of prayer like him. To be honest, folks, there are times when, when in prayer I will go to the Father and I will pray simply and kind of casually and comfortably. But it's like the words go up and bounce off the ceiling. Nothing happens. And I wonder why. You know what I learned? I've learned that during such seasons... The Father God is saying, pray fervently, son. Come back a second time and a third time and an eighth time and even a twelfth time. Why? Because I know what's up ahead. Friend, you got to get this. Earnest and persistent prayer is essential. Whereas half-hearted prayer is self-defeating. Pray, pray, pray persistently. Pray earnestly until God gives the answer. And finally, step number four in releasing the power of prayer. Pray specifically. Pray specifically. Look again with me. James chapter 5, verse 17 to 18. It said, he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall. And none fell for three and a half years. Then he prayed again, and the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crops. So do you ever struggle sometimes with knowing what to pray for? Do you ever have trouble coming, with coming up with the right words to say? Maybe you think of certain requests, but, but when, when it's time to voice them to God... You resort to using such vague phrases as, bless this person, Lord. <laughs> you don't need to feel guilty about it. But because, because God wants us to pray and communicate with him. Whatever, whatever words we want to use. You don't have to be eloquent or polished to pour out your heart intimately to your heavenly father. But watch this. You do need to understand that if you don't pray specifically about, uh, about what is on your heart, you're missing out on a whole level of blessing in talking to God. Notice Elijah prayed, he prayed specifically for drought, and it came. Uh, and, and then again, he prayed specifically for rain, and it came. He didn't say, Lord, bless the weather. No, but he was specific in his prayer. He prayed for God to withhold the rain. Sometimes we must pray in detail. Let me illustrate it for you. Maybe you have a problem. Maybe you have a problem taking control of your finances, and you decide to pray about that. You need to pray specifically for, listen to this, money wisdom. <laughs> you need to ask God why you're in financial trouble. You see, before we can fix a stall car engine, we, we, we've got to learn the cause of the problem. You know, there's an old saying that goes, a problem well defined is a problem half solved. For example, there are some specific things about finances that you might pray for. You might pray for insight into why you can't control your money. Or, or, or you can pray for wisdom to to understand the principles of controlling your money. Or you can, you can pray for strength to manage your money continually. Oh, here's one. You can pray for shopping, shopping wisdom, 
as you cut up the credit cards. Th this, is, this is similar to the conditions that Jesus gave for prayer in Mark. Mark 11, verse 23. Mark 11, 23. He says, I tell you the truth. You can say this to this mountain. May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea. And it will happen. What am I saying? I'm saying if you want specific answers, you need to make specific requests when you pray. General requests. They produce general answers, which are, which are not satisfactory at all to anybody. It is true that sometimes we cannot always pray as specifically as we would like, but, but as we pray. But, but pray as specifically as you can. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will, will, will make it as specific as it, as it needs to be. Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 26 makes this promise. So the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we do not know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us. In other words, when we are weak uh, and we do not know exactly how we should pray, God himself, through the Holy Spirit, helps us by making intercession for us. Whoa! <laughs> My dear friend, maybe your weakness is controlling your concentration or distractions or, or wandering thoughts or emotional turmoil or whatever your particular weakness is this morning, the Holy Spirit will help you with that weakness when you pray. But as I close, let me share three practical suggestions on how to begin this wonderful journey into praying powerfully. Uh, number one, have a quiet place and go there every day. Have a quiet place and go there every day. Perhaps there's a spare room in your house. Perhaps it's in the basement. Or, or go for a walk in the park. Maybe you can pray at your kitchen table early in the morning before anyone else is up. Perhaps there's time to pray uh, in, in your office with a do not disturb sign on the door. Perhaps you can pray in your car. You know, Jesus prayed every day early in the morning. He, he'd leave and go for a walk to some secluded spot to pray. Number two, maintain an alert posture. Maintain an alert posture. People in the Bible assume many different postures when they prayed. Sometimes they, they knelt. Sometimes they fell face down on the ground. Sometimes they were standing or walking and sometimes their faces was, was turned toward heaven. So be alert. Oh, watch this. When you get to your private spot and assume an alert posture, spend a few moments thinking about the fact that you're drawing near to God's very presence. Oh, don't primarily think about your prayer list at this time or the things you need to ask for. Think about the fact that the next few minutes will be spent in fellowship and conversation, conversation with your Heavenly Father, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Almighty God. And number three, pray out loud even if it's in just a whispered voice. Folks, there are common sense reasons for this. For one thing, it actually, actually speaking the words, not merely thinking them, helps us to stay focused and keeps our mind from wandering. For the same reason, most people find it helpful to, to close their eyes when they pray. They can better focus on God and not be distracted by things around them. You know what? There are very few prayers in the Bible that, are si that were silent prayers. Yeah, I know. 
Hannah, somebody will say to me, Corville, Hannah prayed silently in, in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Yeah, but even then her lips formed the words. It's so sad that we do so much mental praying where our voices are seldom heard even by ourselves. So pray out loud. Precious people, the Bible says that Elijah was a man with the same nature as ours, and yet his prayers brought repentance to an entire nation. So, so, so do, you, do you feel that you're an ordinary dad? Do you feel that you're an ordinary mom? Think how powerful your prayers can be as you follow these simple steps in prayer. No matter who you are, here they are again, if you will pray. Pray with a clean heart. Pray earnestly. And pray specifically. Then you will see God at work powerfully in your life and in the world around you. So we invite you this morning. Our question to you is simply, how can we pray for you?